Hi everyone, this is Niladri. Welcome to session 11 of Project Management Professional Training Series. So this session 11 is in continuation of session 10 and I recommend strongly to uh, combine or to do uh, immediately your session 11 after session 10. The reason is that in session 10, we have gone through uh, the theoretical concept of critical path. And session 11, we are going to do one or two examples uh, to ensure that we know how to crack these problems uh, from the exam point of view. All right, so let's step in. So like I said, session 11 will be based on uh, the examples for critical path, and we are going to see how do we crack them. And one of the most essential component of PMP exam is time management. So these questions are pretty simple. Like somebody said very nicely that if instead of four hours, I would have gone, got six hours for the PMP exam, then I would have cleared it, right? Most of the people who who cannot make the PMP exam the first time or even second time, they always complain that they wish they had more time. So the more time you have, uh, you you definitely will have all the time to you know uh, do your problems nicely and slowly and go through the use cases. But unfortunately, we do not have that luxury in the PMP exam. Now to ensure that you are cracking the exam and with a good speed and also with the good kind of accuracy on the exam always ensure that your questions on the mathematical part, like your critical path questions, your network diagram questions, your questions on the schedule and cost basically, and few other uh, you know, sections are there where the maths will be there. These are absolutely correct because these are easy questions. The more you practice, the more you master them to do faster and you, you gain the marks immediately. And why you have to do them fast and correct? Because you gain the marks and you also save time for the bigger questions, the use cases where you have to really go through that question, probably line by line, go through all the options for line by line, right? But uh, when you are solving a mathematical question, you really don't have to choose between the multiple choices. If the answer is five, the answer, you just have to select five from the multiple. It cannot go be, it that like five cannot be 15 or 20 because it's a maths question. But if it's a subjective question, then you, you have to look into all the four options. Out of them, two will be like kind of trash, which you have to scratch it off. And the remaining two will be very close to each other. And from there, uh, your eyes will tell you that which is the best one. So starting with critical path examples. Example one, let's go through a kind of a question which you generally see in the exam. Now in the exam, when we are talking about the activities or durations or dependencies, generally the diagrams are not given. It is expected the candidate will draw the diagram and you get a piece of paper and a pen or uh, you, you get a piece of a, a, what do you say, a scratch pad uh, with you and that's been given to all the candidates and you're expected to in a draw it there. If you ask me, are those scratch pads being checked at the end of the exam? No, they are not checked. They are, they are like being being left by you, but they are not going for any kind of, re, I mean, uh, you know, uh, scoring points or something. Okay, they are there. They are there just for your rough work. So it is expected for the candidate to ensure that they are using those scratch pads uh, to draw the network diagrams or to draw any kind of uh, diagrams there on the exam uh, or to do any kind of calculations on the exam, which will help them. There is no calculator uh, in the exam as well. Okay, so. In the lesson 10, you would have uh, seen or remember that I, I, I drew a kind of a tabular chart, like an Excel sheet kind of thing where I told this is the activities, these are the names of the activities, and these are durations, these are the dependencies and all that. It's an easy read, right? However, in the exam, you will not get a tabular chart. The exam question will be something like this. Um, following dependencies exist for activities in a project as below. And it will call it out like activity one can start immediately and has duration of two weeks. So the moment you start reading, I, I will say go through it or scan it quickly. You don't have to like go, go line by line. You're just trying to give you a kind of a sense like activity one can start like from the start button itself and has the total time of let's say two weeks. Activity two can start after activity one is completed. So activity two has got a direct dependency on activity one, right? Mandatory dependency. And this will be having the duration of 12 weeks. Similarly, activity three can start after activity one is completed and has the duration of 10 weeks. So activity two and three, they both are having the dependency on activity one. Uh, then activity four can start after activity two is completed. 
and it's got a duration of six weeks. And activity five can start after activity four is complete along with three is complete. So when four and three both are complete, then your activity five can start and five is having the duration of eight weeks. So this is the kind of the question which you expect in the exam. Once you scan it, your immediate work will be that pick up that pen, that paper and draw the diagram. I'm not asking you to draw a very artistic diagram or something. Uh, don't spend too much of time thinking about the aesthetic value of the diagram. Uh, just use plain and simple rectangles or squares for the activity. Why I tell don't use a circle? Because if you use a circle, you may lose out on pointing out the edges, which is like early start, early finish, late start, late finish kind of stuff, right? So always use the rectangle because it's easy to mark the rectangle on, on all the four corners and center will be like uh, the float value. Okay, so in this kind of a question or in this kind of a use case, the question will be what is the critical path and duration of the critical path? And it will also ask you what is the float of, let's say one of the activities, activity two. Okay, so let's see. Our immediate task, you know, like I said, will be to draw this diagram. Now, when I want to draw the diagram here, we have got some color coding and start and end. I have given like brown color and uh, green color. You don't have to bother about any colors or anything of that sort. Just probably write a S. And from the S, you mark an arrow and then say activity one can start immediately and as duration of two weeks. So after that, you go into activity one. That is the first box which you see there. And you can just uh, show it to you once again. Two can start after one. Three can start after one, four can start after two. So see, two can start, uh, like after one, we have got two and three, but four is starting after two, which is marked here. And and your uh, five is starting after four and three, both are completed. See, five and five can start after four and three is completed, right? The duration wise, you, you just mark the boxes with, you know, two, 12, 10, six, like whatever is being shown here, right? And you mark it. Now this is the picture. Once you get the picture correct, remember all the questions can be answered immediately, but the picture has to be correct. If you make the picture incorrect, if you are not having the sense of the uh, of the bullet points, what is being told about the activities and the dependencies, you will never get the picture correct. And if the picture is not correct, then, then everything else will fail. Okay, so ensure that you get that 30 seconds more time to get the picture correct and trust me, the more you practice on this, it all depends how much you practice. It will come to a stage to you that you will be like drawing this diagram within probably five to 12 seconds, you will draw this diagram quickly, okay? And, uh, and some people, they also do a mistake and don't do that. They try to do this mentally. Like activity one can start, they try to draw, draw the diagram like mentally. I will say, don't do that. The chances of failure are very high. Maybe at home you have done that because at home you get a more comfortable kind of an environment, right? You, you could have done that. But remember it's an exam, the clock is ticking in front of you. You have paid some good money on the exam. Exam fees is high. A lot of pressure is on you. Don't try to add unnecessary pressure on your brain when you already have got a nice pen and a paper in front of you, right? So once you get the durations and the paths correct, then all your job is to find out what are the two paths or what are the three paths or four paths or five paths between start and end. So here we have got only two paths. One is one, two, four, five. That is one path. And one is one, three, five. Okay. And once you find out the paths there, then your job is to just add the duration on that path. What is the duration? So if I uh, go ahead and just pick up my uh, annotation here. Uh, okay. If I pick up the path like one, two, four, and five, the first path, then it is like two plus 12, which is 14, plus six, 20, and plus eight is 28, which is my first path, right? And my second path is one, three, and five, which is two plus 10 plus eight, which is uh, 12 plus eight, and that is 20. Now remember the definition of the critical path, it is longest duration and shortest time, right? So duration is longest of which path? One, two, four, five is longest, it's 28. So basically your critical path is this path, which is one, two, four, five, right? Now that's one great thing which I've achieved because if you, if you know the critical path, then it will be very easy to know what is the float of this path. So every item, or every activity on the critical path will be having a float of zero, 
right? Because it's shortest time. So, so all the, uh, you know, uh, uh, float will be zero on these boxes, which also makes your job easy if you want to find further like early start and early finish and late start and late finish with the forward pass and the backward pass because you already know the float in between, right? Now, let me go back to the previous slide. The questions are what? What is the critical path and duration of the critical path? The critical path is one, two, four, five, and the duration is 28, okay? The longest duration is the duration of the critical path. And secondly, what is the float of activity two? The activity two, it's, it's lying in the critical path, right? One, two, four, five. So two, the float will be zero because every activity in the critical path, the float is zero, simple, right? So that's how it is. Now imagine if you would have been asked to find out a little bit more than this, like uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the uh, early start or the early finish, then you start like this, you know, from the activity one, uh, let me pick up my annotation again. Um, uh, and then you can start like this, like this is like zero, the zero plus two is two, two is your starting point, two plus 12 is 14, 14 is your starting point, 14 plus six is 20, 20 is starting point, 20 plus eight is 28. So 28 is your early finish. And then you can pick up the 28 here also as well. Then 28 minus eight is 20, which is backward pass and like that you go. Okay, just refer to the lesson 10 on how to do the forward pass and backward pass, but be very fluent in them. Try to do as much practice. So if you have got a hard copy book, you will be getting a lot of questions at the end, at the end of each chapter. And also online, there are a lot of mock questions there, okay, which you can practice and be very sharp on this kind of questions because this will really make you nice. And this will really, uh, you know, uh, uh, take you off of that uh, spending too much time on these kind of questions. See, the aim is not just to be correct on the exam. The aim is to be fast and accurate on the exam, not just correct. Because if it's just about being correct on the exam, like many people have said, I wish I had you know one more hour in the exam, right? Then I would have passed. And many people, you know, they complain on this. So since the time is of essence here, you really have to be uh, a solid expert and you can only become an expert by practicing one thing again and again and again and again, right? Okay. Now that is about the easy part. Now, things will be twisted a bit like here and there. So PMP may also ask you, let me show you the example, which I'm continuing from, from the example one. So example two, I'm trying to continue from the example one, the similar kind of the approach, but all I'm saying is that the resource working on activity three is replaced with another resource who has less experience. So if the resource is replaced with a person with a lesser experience, then definitely your duration will go high, right? Because that person cannot do the job in, in a faster uh, pace than the guy who can do that with a more experienced one. So the activity will now take 12 weeks. Instead of, let's say, uh, in the activity three, the duration was like 10 weeks. But since we are getting a new buy or a lesser experienced guy, now the time taken will be 12. Now the question, it's a very nice question. It's telling, how does this affect the project end date? If I get a lesser experienced you know, resource in an activity, which is a very realistic way, right? In your program, you will find this always happening on and off. Maybe um, you know, one of your resource, uh, he is deciding to leave the company and you are hiring a person and that, 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 that person is a brand new person from another company. Right, so they probably will not know a lot of things about this company, the org structure and how the things work, and uh, about the historical projects, lessons learned, teams. Nothing will be known to the person, right? So, and also he may not be having that kind of a flavor or that kind of a uh, what you say, a suaviness compared to the experienced guy. So when this guy comes in, he will not be able to deliver in the same uh, pace or same velocity as the past guy. And definitely things will take a little bit long time. This is a very, very common thing happening in many projects. And you will also see that happening once in a while in your project as well. So you have to calculate that. Okay, if I replace this guy with the new guy, then what is the impact on my day one, which I promised to my customer? So let's see what is the impact. Okay, impact is, look at it. If I make it 12, then again, I'm going to calculate the critical path. Now, critical path still remains the same because in this case, one, two, four, five will add up to 28. There is no change in that. And one, three, five will add up to 12 plus two is 14. 14 plus eight is 22. So still 22 is lesser than 28. So 28 still lies the critical path. Now, as I told you, if 
if uh, uh, you know there is no impact on the critical path then there is no impact on the project day one as promised why because the remaining tasks they all have got a buffer here there is a float to them and and uh, though the delay is there like instead of 10 you are doing it in 12 weeks still you can match it up right you have got the time still you are less than 28 let's say this 12 went to 30 weeks then definitely would have been a problem because 30 plus 2 would have been 32 and 32 plus it is 40 and 40 is higher than 28 and then it's a problem because then this would have been the critical path and and then it would have taken like higher time but but let's say if it is 12 then it is not going to change the critical path the critical path remains the same which is one two four five and and then we are not bothered because we had the buffer now the immediate next question can be what is the float of activity two now uh activity two is zero i'm sorry the float we can say uh activity three here uh, okay uh, now uh, now in this case they can also ask like, like activity two if the critical path has changed but in your case i will i will tell you that go and solve uh, the float of activity three, which is not on the critical path. Try it out yourself. How the float of activity three will be calculated? Again, do a common forward pass from start till end. I'm sorry, from start till end. And then again, do a reverse pass from end till start. And once you do that, the forward pass and the reverse pass, you will immediately get the float. Uh, we can try it out right now. So let's, let's see, your one follows in the critical path, right? So one, the float will be zero. So we'll start from zero, zero plus two is two. And then uh, here also zero plus two is two. The late finish will be two. Now this late finish, you, you can uh, you know plug this guy here, like two plus 12 is 14. And then again, you can plug it here, uh, like 14 plus eight is 22, right? Now you can uh, grab it from here or either you can do a complete forward pass on the critical path. And from there, you can start the backward pass from here. So if you do the forward pass from here, then it is zero plus two is two, two plus 12 is 14, 14 plus six is 20, 20 plus eight is 28. So 28 is here standing. And you take the 28 as the late finish as well on the bottom. And then you minus out 28 minus eight is 20, which is here, that is the uh, late start. And 20, when you got like 28 minus 20, uh, like 28 minus 8 is 20 then 20 when you got as the uh, late start then you plug it down here that is you you make the uh, 20 appear on the uh, block 3 let me pull, pull out my annotation here let me do it once again for you guys just to explain to that so we have got let's say 28 here by the forward pass now i make the 28 as the late finish then 28 minus minus 8 is 20 here right which is the late start that late start will be the late finish here so basically the 20 will be here then 20 minus 12 is how much which is 8 so 8 will be here and then again you can do 8 minus 2 that is 6 here right so once you do 6 here then and this is 8 so you can find it out uh, you know how much will be the float okay so do it yourself and uh, and let me know how the float will be the float will be zero for this path but definitely for this activity three, the float will change. It will not be zero, okay? Um, one more thing, if at all the critical path changes, sometimes the exam will be giving the tricky question. If the critical path changes due to the duration is so high that it changes the critical path, then it will ask you, what is the float of that activity two now? Because it is no longer a critical path, okay? So be ready for both of these questions. Like in a network diagram, the easiest way to solve it or crack it is that draw the diagram accurately, okay, in a, in a uh, short span of time, draw it quickly and ac accurately. And once you have drawn it, immediately you will know what is the CP or the critical path because the longest path is a critical path, right? And you can mark those boxes like 0, 0, 0, 0 in the bottom or in the, in the middle because the, the float is zero. And then find out what other questions are being asked. Sometimes you have to do the entire network diagram, forward pass and backward pass, which is okay, which is not a big deal at all. But if those kind of questions are not asked, then you don't have to really spend your time in solving the network diagram. If, if the question is all about the critical path and the float of activity in the critical path, then you know the answer. The float of any activity in the, in the CP or in the critical line of path will be always zero, 
right? And the critical path, if you want to find out the duration, or if you want to find out the, the critical path, you really don't have to solve the network diagram completely end to end. But for more minute questions, like what is the float of this particular activity, which is not in the critical path, then you have to solve the entire diagram, do a forward pass and backward pass. It will take a little bit time, but it's easy actually. And then you will find out the uh, float there. Okay. So that's about it. The key is again, practice, practice and practice. Um, and you will reach to or reach to a certain stage where you kind of draw the diagram or draw any kind of diagram from a use case very quickly and uh, can uh, plug out the critical path uh, immediately. Because once you plug out the critical path immediately, the remaining things will come very, very quickly to you. All right, with that, we came to the end of the session. Like I said, it's a very small and quick session. All I wanted to do was just take you through the critical path, two examples. One is the basic one, which covers about what is a critical path and how to, and what is the float of activity in a critical path, which is a tricky question. PMP is just trying to check, do you know also that float is zero on a critical path? And one is about changing that same question, like twisting it, uh, into a more practical sense, like what if I change a resource into one of the activities and it takes more time, then what is the impact on the project end date? If changing the resource and the duration is not going to impact the critical path, then there is no change in the project because then it's just like you had a buffer and you are playing, playing with the buffer, right? Uh, but if changing the resource duration is going to change the critical path as well, then definitely it's going to have an impact on the project end date. So with that, we came to the end of the session. Thank you very much for watching this. I hope you had a good time and good understanding of the critical path, how it's been calculated. We'll do more of this in the future. We will we will carry on with our uh, problem solving you know, sessions, uh, a couple of them once we finish cost, and then we will be getting into the problem solving of CPI, SPI, and so on. Thank you for watching. I hope you had a great time. Uh, thank you all and wish you all a good day. Cheers, bye.